Um, he will focus on what he has learned from a variety of written and oral sources about the presence of California condors along the Columbia River in the 19th century. He wrote about this in his book, Visible Bones, but has continued to do more research and he'll share what he has learned in the meantime with us. And just a quick aside, if you have an opportunity to go to Birds of the World, there's a wealth of information about California condors there that would be well worth your time. Um, in addition to looking backwards, uh, Jack will also discuss the prospects for the future release of captive birds intended to reestablish the California condor's presence in our region. And many of you may already be familiar with some of, of Jack's writings. Um, I, I discovered him when I read uh, his book that focuses on David Douglas of Douglas fur fame. And he's also written books, uh, biographies, award-winning biographies of others, uh, David Thompson, the fur trader, as well as other books on human and natural history of the Intermountain West. And if you go to his website, www.jacknesbit.com, you can see there are more books than you can see on the screen. So when you get there, you can cycle your way through and see all the books. And at this point, I'll stop and invite Jack to take the screen and uh, share a little bit about his background and then give his presentation. Thank you, Jack. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. All right, well, we're ready to go then. Does this, does this slide up like it's supposed to be? Yes. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I've had a lot of fun getting this set up with you guys. Uh, this is, uh, as Vicki said, it it's built on a piece that I wrote for a book called Visible Bones that came out some time ago, but I just never got over condors. And that often happens, uh, with birds, as you know, you see one that, uh, that you're attracted to and you just follow it. And uh, I'll start by going through what that piece uh, describes, which is the period of contact. One of the things it focuses on is the period of contact and how uh, William Clark through this great map when he was at the Wind River in 1805 and put a condor drawing over on the right side. Of it. It's clearly, clearly a condor. And um, that sort of enters the bird world, which was very excited about all this, that, there was, that they were a part of the scene in the Columbia drainage uh, for a very long time, and that there were still plenty of them left at the period of contact. Uh, Lewis and Clark go on down to winter at Fort Clancy, and they they uh, see the famous whale that has surrounded by condors. Uh, one of their hunters brings one in so that Clark can do uh, probably Clark can do a more detailed drawing. And this is such a wonderful drawing if you're look at people who do bird art. The ear hole is really prominent, which is something you hear over and over again. The way the nares work out and the beak is hooked and the way the rough comes in and is so prominent, that's condor stuff. And they do a really good job of describing it. They uh, don't have room to send a full skin back to Philadelphia, so they send a couple of skulls back, but that's it. And, uh, Everybody who goes west after that, who has any kind of interest in natural history, is looking for condors because of this Lewis and Clark, uh, because of the way they wrote about them so beautifully and the, the, the different places they saw them. So they describe them as a bird that's common on the lower Columbia River and winters there. But uh, David Douglas who is a Scottish horticultural collector, but crazy about all kinds of natural history, actually made a trip to the Atlantic States just before he came to the Columbia and went to Philadelphia to look at all of Lewis and Clark's collections. 
So he knew all about it and he was really interested in seeing one as soon as he got out here and knew what he was doing. He knew how to look for things. And he got up with a Hudson Bay Company agent named uh, George Barston, who was uh, a decent naturalist before, but Douglas kind of helped him up his game. And they spent the winter of 1825-26 at Fort Vancouver, which was in the process of being built. This is a little bit later. But there was livestock there. And um, they both wrote amazing stuff about how as soon as a horse died, there'd be condors up in the air circling it. And there was turkey vultures around. They told them uh, they had big discussions about whether they were getting their prey by visuals from soaring and looking or by smell, by smelling something dead. They did these experiments where they would go out and bury a uh, dead cow, dead pig under the brush and see if they could find them and came to the conclusion that these birds used both their sight and their smell to locate their prey. And that has proved to have been true. And there's there's lots of recent papers about that very thing. So the thing that Douglas did that really got away with me, uh, and may, actually I wrote a book first and did a whole biography of him because he was so thorough, is he expanded condor range greatly. He traveled south with some food trade people and went down to the Umpqua in southern Oregon, proved that they wintered there, saw them in good numbers, then talked to hunters, which means fur trade hunters, and mixed blood hunters, which means tribal French mix usually, and Hawaiians, and tribal people trying to find out more about their natural history. He got some things wrong. He, he heard some information that was not correct, saying, like saying that they were laid black eggs on the ground like a turkey vulture does. But that's part of birding, as you all know. There's You have to assess each detail by yourself and try to truth it out and, and see what is going on, what is real and what is not. And uh, Douglas got, these hunters told Douglas that the condors were common all the way up river and far into the Snake River country in the Boise Basin. And that, again, that's that's a clue as it goes on. Then in 1832, just a few years later, Thomas Nuttall came out with the Wyeth expedition and he had a young birder from Philadelphia named John Townsend with him who was just mad about birds. He was only 25. And he looked, started looking for condors as soon as he crested the Continental Divide. And he has a sort of a classic account that encapsulates a lot of what uh, we know about what con how condors acted and how people acted in the lower Columbia. And I'm just going to read you a little piece of his. Uh, he visits Willamette River, and there's a salmon run. It's in May, and there are lots of tribal people there from different tribes. And he notices a bunch of turkey vultures sailing a rustling noise attracted my attention, and there, to my inexpressible joy, soared the great Californian, seemingly intent upon watching the motions of his puny relative. The condor wheeled and plunged toward a freshly beached salmon. The naturalist fired his musket, and the vulture fell on the opposite side of the river. An excited Townsend wasted no time in shedding his clothes and plunging naked into the Willamette. A few vigorous strokes carried him across the current, and he sprang upon shore to secure his covetous specimen. But the huge creature had only been wing broken, and as I approached him, seemed determined not to yield himself a royal captive. Having left his musket with his clothes on the opposite shore, Townsend looked around for a stick. When he couldn't find one, he desperately began pelting the condor with stones. Men, women, children, and dogs who had been startled by his gunshot flocked from the nearby village to see what was going on. For the next half hour, the naked white man danced a stuttered tango with the injured condor, which sometimes hobbled awkwardly away when attacked, and at others dashed furiously at me, hissing like an angry serpent, compelling me likewise to run. The laughter of the village women ran in, rang in Townsend's ears as he tried to kick sand in the attacking vulture's eyes. Finally, he flung a lucky stone that plunked his quarry squarely in the head, 
and a stunned bird fell to the ground. Townsend borrowed a knife from one of the village men and skinned his quarry with people crowding around him, both amused and curious. So again, this is a great attribute of bird, bird people all over and naturalists all over. They make it sound like they're the only ones there at the same time as admitting there's people all over the place that obviously you know, knew a lot about condors and had lived with them while they were fishing salmon together for a very long time. And it's the laughter that's really uh, makes this story to me is that they, they think he's crazy, but it's funny what he's doing. And the condor is such a charismatic bird that they're all into it as part of the deal. So Townsend sends this condor back east. It gets, it goes through a lot of hands. It passes through a lot of hands, but it ends up in the Smithsonian Institution. And this is the bird that's still a specimen down in the bowels of the Smithsonian. And it might be that this is the bird that John Audubon painted his condor from. Audubon purchased, Audubon was just finishing Birds of America, and he was desperate to get some Western species there. He'd never been beyond the, really, the uh, lower Missouri. So he purchased a lot of specimens from Nuttall while Townsend was still out here. The Townsend had shipped back. And one of them is probably this condor. He also might have seen a condor from California than when he was in London trying to sell his book. But this is the painting that Audubon comes up with. And it's a classic. Everybody has seen it. And it's, it's the one he calls California vulture. Townsend himself gets back with the same kind of ambition that Audubon has. He wants to do an ornithology of the United States of America. Of, North America, and he has all these Western birds and knows about their life history that Audubon can't touch. Audubon uses Townsend's account in his text of his birds of America. Townsend starts painting on his book. The very first plate that he does is the California condor. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a good job, but he, the one he saw was down fishing on the, at the falls of the Willamette, and he depicts it up in the mountains, much more romanticized. Townsend contacts lead poisoning and dies before he can get very much done, but he really uh, is important to this story because this condor that he sends back is the last bird specimen, official ornithological specimen that anybody sends back from the Columbia. And again, this is, the 1830s, so we're talking about a while ago. So uh, the general story, uh, the, the way I learned it as a kid was that, you know, condors were around and somebody shot a bunch of them and they were gone. There couldn't have been that many to an extent. But this, the real story is so much more fun than that and so much uh, more far reaching. Than that. And it involves the entire Columbia Basin in the way that David Douglas was talking about. So. <laughs> The naturalists would look for the condors, the Wilkes expedition in 1841, the railroad survey guys in 1844, Cooper sees one, the Wilkes expedition, uh, Peel sees a couple in southern Oregon. He talks to homesteaders who have seen them. In the boundary survey in 1860, there were both British and American naturalists who were really good birders who, who don't really see, they hear about them, but don't see them. But um, that doesn't mean that they're gone because these people were visitors as opposed to living with the birds. So in 1879, in other words, half a century almost after Townsend shot his condor, there was an army general named T.E. Wilcox who retired and had a ranch in the Boise Basin in this, uh, this same year. And he was, a, was very knowledgeable about birds and he wrote an autobiography during World War I, so sometimes later. And he said that in 1879, he saw two California vultures feeding on the carcass of one of his sheep. They hissed at me and ran along the ground for some distance before they were able to rise in flight. They were much larger than turkey buzzards, with which I was quite familiar, and I was very close to them so that I could not be mistaken in their identity. The 
The cattlemen said that the California vulture or buzzard was not uncommon at all there before they began to poison carcasses to kill wolves. So here we are in, in the present day, really, is wolves, bug, ranchers, in the early ranchers in all over the Northwest in the late 1800s in the same way that they're bugging people now. And they're, uh, very, they, they decided to poison them out and extirpate them and were very successful at it. But as soon as you start poisoning carcasses with strychnine, you are gonna be killing all the buzzards and condors that come around to eat carrion. And that is such a key phrase from Wilcox that it's not collectors or ornithologists that killed out the condors. And there were certainly still plenty of salmon in 1879 coming up the Columbia and to the Snake and all north into Canada on the main stem. But they could not handle, you know, and they had a whole new source of food in livestock. But poisoning carcasses is a way to get rid of things like this. And that is, that's the story we have today. And it's the story that we've been struggling with for the century and a half since Wilcox. Now, in 1896, the head of the U.S. Biological Survey was a man named C. Hart Merriam, who's famous as a mammal person, published many, many papers about ground squirrels and grizzly bears, was a terrific naturalist, uh, has did a lot of plant relationship and ecological zones. He really introduced a lot of concepts that, that we still use today. Uh, and he grew up in a family in New England uh, as a birder. And I, I, you gotta love that. He's named after DeWitt Clinton. His first name is Clinton. And uh, there, who was also a good birder who David Douglas knew. And, and so you, I, it's impossible not to be attracted to where these, these threads of bird lore fuel the natural history interest and further the scholarship of it as they go along. So Clint Merriman had a sister named Florence Merriam. Clint Merriam had an ace field helper named Bailey. And Florence married Bailey, so her name becomes Florence Merriam Bailey. And she didn't ever do anything but birds. She published a very influential field guide called Birds Through the Opera Glass, about looking at birds through an opera glass that had really a lot of the earmarks of field guides that we use today. And she then published a Western field guide that was, these are really terrific books. And she got her husband to write some of the things, uh, some of the accounts in them. They were just wonderful field couples all over California and lots in Oregon and into the Northwest. So she's tied up with Clint while he's going out and collecting his ground squirrels and keeping his journals. And she's really hawking the birds all over the West and, and turning the public on her whole her whole interest was in outfits like yours, where she excites the general public about the whole world and the connectivity and the lessons that birds have to teach us. So um, here's one of the ways she thought about her brother. This is a little sketch she did of him. And um, this uh, 1896 is a great year because the following year, 1897, Clint Merriam made this classic trip to Mount Rainier where he, he he's buddies with Gifford Pinchot and John Muir and all the early conservationists and uh, all the people who are trying to figure out what to do with public lands and how to preserve wetlands and wildlife and, the, you know, the national forest, the national wildlife um, refuge system. They're, they're sort of puzzling all that out. It's a bunch of power, a very small bunch of powerful white men in Washington that are doing this, of course. And when he comes back from Mount Rainier, back to his job in Washington, D.C., he goes overland through the Okanagan and comes down to Cooley City, where there's this railroad that he can pick up and take to Spokane and on back east. So here's Cooley City in 1900. And um, he gets on the train and he's pinning around in his journal, as naturalists do. He's keeping his journal. And this is what this entry for September 30th, 1897, just a couple days ago, right? I mean, it's just turning fall. And it, this is a very 
uh, humdrum kind of journal and bird list for the day, like any of us might keep if we're out in the field. Left Cooley City by train on the Washington Central Railroad, which ends here at 6.30 a.m., reached Spokane at 2 p.m. On leaving Cooley City, a very small settlement of mostly empty houses, the railroad makes a sweep to the northeast in order to avoid as much lava as possible from the uh, Ice Age floods, of course, and then winds about in a generally easterly direction for 125 miles to Spokane. Immediately east of Cooley City, it traverses a nearly level bunch grass plain, which rises just north of the railroad. And then he puts his birds down, metal arcs are common all along in the grass country. Several sparrowhawks were seen, kestrels. A kingfisher was seen on Goose Creek near Wilbur. Always good to see a kingfisher. And a few magpies in several places. Then at the bottom of this page, and you can see it on the left, he puts brackets in and says, I saw a condor on the ground near the train on the northern side of the track just after leaving Cooley City, but from some caution refrained from recording the fact at the time. Now this is uh, when Jewett did his famous Birds of Washington book in the 40s and 50s, he was asking for records and Clint Miriam sent him a letter that said, oh, I saw one in Cooley City in 1897. And I spent, <laughs> I spent a long time looking for his journal for that day, but of course it's the internet makes everything possible now. And this is the journal entry for the last accepted ornithological record from Washington State of a California condor. And it's standing on the ground outside of Cooley City. And it's probably among the weeds, just like this one is. And um, that brings into play all the kinds of skills that bird and ornithology and, and casual birding bring up, is how do you identify a bird? Is it, can you identify a condor standing on the ground? Uh, all the counts from Wilpox to uh, Douglas to all, uh, all of these ones always describe them as being with turkey vultures. They're so much bigger than turkey vultures. They're acting different. There's different things that they do. And I guess my position is that Clint Merriam was just a visitor, just like these other early naturalists. He was good at what he did, but he wasn't living on the landscape with the birds and the people and the things that the birds do. And so there's lots of ways that condors hung around that made them invisible to ornithologists and casual birders. And I wanna run through some of the records and you can make up your own mind about whether it's a good record or not. I would say I don't accept all of them, but I definitely don't turn them all down. Um, this is when I was going around with the Visible Bones book I was talking about condors and I did a presentation at a retirement home in Spokane and to the Audubon Society, which met in the basement of this retirement home. And at the end of it, a man named Bill Brown came up to me. He had been born in 1915. His father was a district warden in the Umpqua National Forest. And during the depression between 1930 and 35, Bill was aged 15 to 20. And his dad just put him out in these fire towers. He worked in five fire towers in the Umpqua, several of which are still around. They look like this now. White Rock, Dutchman Butte, North Sis, Silver Butte, and the South Umpquas. He would work from July 1st to October 15th. During his time in the towers, Bill said he saw single condors flying several times. Often the birds glided below the level of the lookout tower, so he was able to see their heads clearly. He knew turkey vultures and golden eagles really well, and he was certain that these birds were far larger. They had one of those old radio phone connections between the towers so that they could relay fire information back and forth, and it became a habit for him and his buddies to just communicate with each other tower to tower to tower to say, hey, we got one headed your way. And they would just track the condors working these ridges between the towers. And that was in the depression. And again, 40 years after Miriam's sighting. Another way to think about it, there's all these ways to get evidence about something that's not there, but language certainly works. And this, all the coastal tribes have words for something like a condor. And there's some really good coastal records up to Vancouver Island. Um, 
from this same period, but we're more thinking about the inland where they were supposedly never seen. And there's good words for them in Chinook jargon. Uh, there was a fur trade agent named Samuel Black, who was just a terrible person. But David Douglas stayed with them a couple of times and he kind of got infected with the natural history book. And he kept a dictionary of Walla Walla, Cayuse, and Nez Perce and got different words for condor in each of those languages. Um, Gene Hahn is an anthropologist and a terrific birder that many of you probably know, who worked with the Yakima in the late 70s, early 80s. And he has two different words from mid-Columbia Sahaptan languages for condors. Brian Sharp is a person who is a bird who lived in Oregon in John Day and got hung up on all this and added another Yakima word and uh, another Nez Perce word to what Han had. So again, this is not systematic. Nobody's ever really tried to go get them. I talked to linguists, uh, an Okanagan linguist and a Nez Perce linguist who had different words for condor and uh, talked to both of them at length and decided that they might not be condor words at all. They might have just been extrapolating them because they didn't have the bird knowledge and the elder that they were talking to might not have had the bird knowledge. It takes a whole lot of things to make this work. But um, these these words, I, are, I'm pretty confident in these words here. Then you can also get into the archeology span of this because condors are a Pleistocene bird that ate Pleistocene megafauna all for the last, you know, during the Pleistocene for a couple million years. There were six species of condors in North America covering the whole continent. Um, so you would expect there to be fossils. Uh, California, Gymnogyps just happens to be the one that's left. Um, here, this is uh, the Dalles at Five Mile Rapids, which is a legendary part of the Columbia that has all kinds of lore about it and all kinds of interesting water action about it and all kinds of amazing salmon fishing villages around. And when they closed off uh, John Day Dam and it drowned the Dalles in the early 50s, this is a Corps of Engineers picture before the dam closed. Um, uh, Darty, the famous archaeologist from Washington State University, went and did some salvage uh, archaeology there and found layers of hum continuous human occupation back something like 9,000 years. And in one of them, he found an enormous number of bird bones. And there has been controversy ever since of whether they were culturally put there, whether the people were doing something with the bones or whether it was a back eddy and they just ended up there. But there was a lot of bones, thousands and thousands. The fourth most common bird uh, in this pile of many species was condor. They, were, they found the remains of at least 63 individuals. That is a really big number of birds. And um, a WSU graduate student, Victoria Hansel, went back through the bones just in the last 10 years and to look for butcher marks on the wing bones. And it's, it seems she makes a pretty good case that um, these were culturally used birds, that people were cutting the wings off of them for whatever reason. So, Bones can't lie. I don't think language can lie. Uh, artwork, uh, you have to think about, but I don't know. This is Wisherman Indi Indian Village. This is a photograph taken by Major Mo uh, Lee Morehouse, a great photographer, right around the turn of the century, the time that we're kind of talking about. And um, he probed the Wisherman, and they are the ones that are fishing for salmon just across from that five mile dig. And these are some flat twined root baskets that are in uh, at the Mary Hill Museum and at the High Desert Museum in Bend. And um, there was a great basket person who is now deceased named Mary Schlick, who wrote sort of the standard book about Columbia River basketry. And she talked to elders all up and down the river. Uh, Mary lived on the Colville as a kid and, or, or as a young woman. And, got to know a lot of the tribal people, a lot of the movements up and down the river after salmon and lamprey, and, and talked to a lot of elders. And Nelson Wild Ludum told her in 1989 that, um, that these figures on these bags were certainly condors. 
because that was part of the scene, part of this fishing scene that they were part of. And um, that his people would, that the people used to keep condor chicks in camp tied up on a string to keep away the thunder and lightning because they were lightning birds, which of course the white strikes on their underwings make you think like that. So the fact that no proof of condor breeding has ever shown up, no fossils, no bones, no eggs. Um, I mean, I don't know what to say. Douglas and Lewis and Clark and Townsend never don't see condors breeding. They hear people talking about it that might not be trustworthy. But again, this is artwork that you can make your own decision about the validity of it. But now this one's a little tougher. This is Edward Curtis, who of course is Mr. Indian uh, from Seattle, and he's in Wishram. This is a different way. Yayam is another way of spelling Wishram. One of his plates in the North American Indian is this old man with a scowl holding a primary that is clearly a condor primary. There's different ways he could have gotten it, but that's a condor primary and you can't really deny it. And he's in Wisham Village where these different records and sightings and artwork and bones have been. So that's a, that's a tough one to dismiss. And here's also some stuff that's tough to dismiss. This is um, a Google Earth shot of Lake Salahitai. There's Mount Adams north east of it and Mount St. Helens northwest of it. And um, there's a woman named Ellen Saluskin who talked to a US, a U.S. Forest Service archaeologist named Cheryl Mack in 2006. And she said that in the mid 1800s, in the fall, in Indian Heaven Wilderness, where everybody goes to pick huckleberries from the Sahapton world and other places, at this lake, Sahali Tai Lake, my great grandfather saw a huge black bird that landed and began to devour a half-dressed deer. It had eyes like fire. It appeared enormous. Its beak was long and yellow, and it was constantly opening and shutting its beak. That's a behavioral thing that Douglas has, that Townsend has, and that Lewis and Clark have where they're sort of clapping their beak. The yellowness com comes and goes in the on the beak color. But that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting one. And then Mary Schlick, talked to her and Ellen said that her grandfather killed a condor that had been attracted by an elk that the grandfather had killed. And he killed that condor, took a tail feather and carried it as a talisman for the rest of his life. So Ellen Saluskin's father kind of, you know, he's not the person in the Curtis photo, but he's doing exactly the same thing. So that's one place near Mount Adams where there's some good tribal oral history about a condor in the 20th century. Here's another place northeast of uh, Mount Adams. This is Josephine Andrew Smartalit, who talked to Jean Hun in 1977. Again, Hun is Hun's radar was really out for condor records. Josephine saw uh, a condor as a child at Howard Lake in the 1920s. And she used both of the words that Hun wrote down for condor that he'd heard from other people. They both mean more or less big brown bird, bigger than an eagle, which describes an immature condor very well. Um, she said, the last time I saw the bird, my grandmother was still living. We were camping at Howard Lake and two other men that were with her also saw it, but they were deceased and Jean couldn't talk to them. Then when she was 28 or 30 years old, which would have been during World War II in the 1940s, she saw one again at Howard Lake because they always went up there. It was bald headed, like a turkey, but smoother, like a turkey vulture, but much bigger, black and brown, no white on the wing, sitting on my horse, he could look me in the eye standing. So that's Josephine Andrews. Then here's a place that's directly north. Uh, Lila Wallowitza, who is Wanapum, talked to Jean Hun and said her father spoke about a bird that she used a Wanapum word for it that means condor north of Mount Adams, probably in the 1890s. So when you look at this, it's a lot like David Douglas talking to people and them saying, oh, you know, down in the Umpqua, down in the Umpqua. 
that's the place to see him. And Douglas describing a wintering ground, basically, where he went, he finally went down there himself and saw a lot of sugar pines. And he said condors were part of the world down there, just like we're talking about. And if they were sort of driven away from the river for various reasons, uh, again, this was the time fish wheels were in. Uh, there was a lot of white activity on the river. If they were retreating from them, this would seem like a very isolated, reasonable place to go. But there's other places. This is, again, another Morehouse painting. This is the Warm Springs Indian Agency in Oregon, east of the Mount Hood. And this is a guy named Ken Katya Smith who talked with Brian Sharp, who has a wonderful Condor collect a collection of condor papers like we're talking about that was in the Pacific Northwest Naturalist. Early summer 1950s on the east slope of Mount Jefferson on the Warm Springs Reservation, Smith saw three condors at close range, each perched on a different limb of a large snag 150 feet away. After seeing them, he came upon a winter killed elk in a snowbank on a north facing slope. There around it were a flock of ravens three bald and two golden eagles, and turkey vultures were also present. So all the birds that he could have confused this condor with were present, and in one tree, there were these three birds that weren't any of those. Smith noticed the condor's large size, bald heads, and bare necks. He stated clearly that they were very different than turkey vultures. Then there's always the Nez Perce Reservation. This is Morehouse taking this picture as well. And they have, uh, just as Josiah Pinkman talking about condors using, again, a Nez Perce word. Our, our elders tell us that they're in the area of Seven Devils Wilderness in Hell's Canyon. Seven Devils Wilderness is up in the Craig Mountains on the Idaho side of Hell's Canyon. Again, very isolated. Uh, visitors just don't go there. You have to live there and go hunting every there every year or whatever to have an idea of what else might be there. Then there's one more. We're just kind of circling our way around, getting further and further into the interior. Um, this is the Colville Reservation in Nespelum. Jackie Cook is still the preservation agent there for the tribe. Uh, this is a picture of Stillwater Bay. Uh, another of these amazing turn of the century photographs of what a real river looks like before it was a lake. Jackie was the youngest of a big family. Her brother, Johnny Cook, was 19 when she was born. When Johnny was growing up, her folks grew strawberries on Casimir Bar at the Delta, on the Delta complex on the upstream side of the Okanagan Columbia confluence. Jackie's mother was the first one who told Jackie about her dad seeing a condor. He worked as a cowboy in the summers. He was working for an upstream neighbor. This was long before Chief Joseph Dam was built in the late 40s or early 50s. So you could walk, ride your horse upstream on the Colville Reservation side from the confluence of the Okanagan and just keep going and you'd get to places like Stillwater Bay. Jackie's mom said that on one trip in late summer or early fall, her husband, Johnny, had ridden on upstream towards the Box Canyon area near Stillwater. Along that stretch, he was used to seeing both golden and bald eagles of all ages, as well as turkey vultures during the summer months. Johnny told Jackie that one day in the late summer, her father came home saying that they had seen a very different bird, much larger than the familiar eagles. The bird was flying in close circles, and he was able to watch it for a long time taking careful note of what made it look so different. At home, they had one of those picture dictionaries. And so it had a lot of birds pictures in it. And so they just sat down and started going through it. And when, as soon as Jackie's dad saw the condor, he said, that's it, that's what I saw. So not much way to prove that out, but it would look right to have, uh, if you saw this adult, um, I guess there's all these contradictions in, in condors that you hear about when you talk to a lot of people who have experience with them. They're, some say they're a really hard identification, some say they're really easy. You see them with turkey vultures, which at just about every sighting we've had is, is dealing with, they just are so much larger. If you see them on the ground, 
it, it's, it can be an easy identification. It can be a hard identification if you look at one now. So uh, my wife and I curated a museum exhibit about David Douglas that ran in Spokane for a year, a few years ago, and then moved to Tacoma to the Washington State History Museum for a year. And we decided we needed a condor. We would like to have a condor for this exhibit. Um, we were, I was friends with some people at the Burke and this cap, I knew about this captive breeding program. I hadn't kept up with it for some time. And what happens is a lot of condors in the wild that they release in the wild die and they keep them all because they're endangered species. And they put them, they necropsy them and put them in black garbage bags and put them in a freezer. And they were keeping them in San Diego and the freezers filled up. And the Burke, Rob Fawcett at the Burke volunteered a freezer there. And he thought that he could get a condor for us to use. And then he could use it when the new Burke Museum opened which it did, I think, last year. So I went, oh boy, this is going to be great, thinking of this, uh, of something like this bird here in the slide. And what shows up when we went to look at it <laughs> was this. Uh, this is a dead condor with the wings draped down and the plastic bag skirting it and the head uh, having been all chopped open so they could necropsy it to make sure that it died of, you know, whatever it died of. And that's what we had to work with. But Rob said, I know somebody who can deal with this. And his name was Igor Karagadin. He's from Moldavia. And he, Rob met him on a bird, uh, North Pacific bird expedition. And Igor is a, he has since moved to Los Angeles and started his own taxidermy, museum quality taxidermy business. He is, he does very fine work. And uh, those of you who have been to the new Burke, you can see some of Igor's work. He's amazing. And he took this bird and um, bought it out and just started fooling with it and fooling with it and drying it out and moving it around. He, the head had been destroyed. Uh, if you've ever been to a taxidermist shop, you, you'll see that they have a, usually a shelf of turkey heads because uh, everybody that shoots a turkey wants a stuffed turkey, so they just have these plastic heads. Igor took one of those and sculpted it into a condor head, but the rough on this bird was the rough that the real bird had. So in a sense, this is a real condor, but it's kind of a real condor specimen. And Igor did kind of an amazing job putting it together, and then he did an amazing vertical mount so that it would be even more dramatic. And we put it in the Douglas exhibit and kids would come there there was a wall between it and this flight of stairs that you came down to enter the exhibit and kids would come and they would see this wing up above the wall and there was a certain number of kids in each class that would just forget the rest of the exhibit and walk and stand underneath the condor and just look at it because again they are such a charismatic bird that's they're what they're what happens so that leads us to have to talk about the condor recovery program and the Department of the Interior puts out a report every year. This is 2019, pre-COVID is the last one they put out, of course. But it has, it's so interesting to look at. Um, I was a young birder when the last condors were taken up from the wild in the late 70s. And I, uh, I was outraged that they were doing it. It seemed like the kind thing to do was to let them go extinct as a species, like unplugging your grandmother. But that turned out to be a really, I'm not sure that was the right idea at all. And since then, they have, they have a captive breeding program that is not out of the woods yet, but has had some real successes. And uh, it's worth fooling with because they are condors, I think. So you can see from this that the total world population is 518 and that there's 317 of those are free flying. Some are in Arizona and Utah, the Four Corners, some are in California, and they've released a few in Baja. The 181 captives are mostly in the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise, which is I, I recommend as a field trip because you can really they're the ones that, that raise them and make it work. There's all these other zoos and places that are now participating in it. And the reports is full of these wonderful graphs about what they do, what they have done. 
Here's an age one on the top. It has the number of breeding age birds that have died, but the number of birds that have turned five, turned six, and uh, turned age eight. And, and again, in the four different sites, three different sites that they have. And the idea that there's 141 condors over eight years old, which would be breeding age in 2019, that means that if, if you follow the peregrine falcon program for recovery, you know, that's, you're making progress on some level. Here's another way to look at it, where you have the total population going up, but the wild population is going with it, and the captive population is staying stable. In other words, condors are very long-lived creatures. They have these ones in Boise that are just never going to die. They, they live to be like human-aged. And you don't want to have a pile of them just growing and growing. You want them to slowly go down and the wild numbers to go up if this is going to be a successful program. And the idea, if you look at the bottom and see all the different organizations that are part of the deal here, um, there's, you know, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, of course, but Pinnacles is a very great place to go see a condor if you haven't seen one. Pinnacles uh, Inland from Monterey Bay, Ventana, the Peregrine Fund, of course, is part of this, the Los Angeles Zoo, the San Diego Zoo, and the uh, Chapultepec Blue. I mean, Mexico is a part of this deal because Baja was part of this scene, part of their world, and just ignored for many years. But now they have been some release there. But this is the graph that really gets to me. This pie graph at the top is the mortality in the wild. And you can see there's a whole host of ways they die, from people shooting them to drowning to uh, a bunch of them running to power lines, a uh, bunch of them um, are predated on by wild animals because they're a bird, right? Uh, fire is certainly a problem, especially in certain years. Uh, some of you probably know that a couple of years ago, there was a big fire in Big Sur that toasted a bunch. But they're birds, they can fly, and they, they should be able to get out of their way at some point. But the right side of this graph that says lead poisoning, 50% of the mortalities are caused by birds that eat lead shot from wounded animals, from hunters, and that's going to be a problem. Lead doesn't go away. And a lot of the birds that they have to take in from the wild are birds that have such a high level of lead poisoning that they can't survive out on their own anymore. They bring them into Boise. They try to work the lead out of their system through all these really intense methods. And it's tough. It's a tough go. And California has a law to try to phase out lead shot over time. But, the, uh, you know, that will help but it's not like Washington and Oregon or any other Western state does. So, so there is hurdles to go. But again, there are hurdles that have been passed as well. This is the mouth of the Klamath. Um, this is the Yurok tribe area. They are very behind and, and really insistent upon this being the next pace that they release condors. Uh, an analog in our world is the Cowlitz tribe, who is totally engaged in releasing them on the lower Columbia. And it's going to happen. Uh, and so when, you, when we go out to go birding, if you go down to the Klamath, you'll see soon birds with tags on them like this. And you can go, well, now, are those really wild contours if they've been captive raised and have these tags on them? Or are they something else? And you, you can go ahead and think about that. But they're going to be releasing them on the Columbia in the next decades, say, in the next generation, in the next 100 years. I mean, the time, we have to adjust our clocks to condor time to think about this, and that's in the millions of years. And so many birds are on a much different clock than we are. Tribes that are on the thousands of year clock, clock do a much better job than we do who are on the one year clock. You know, we have to stretch out our idea of how time works in order to really get our minds around what these condors might mean. But we can still always think about it. And Vernon Bailey, again, Florence's husband, this is what he wrote in The Birds of the Western United States that Florence published in 1907. To come upon the California condor alive and free is like suddenly coming upon a giant sequoia towering above the forest. The sequoia awes you with a feeling of immensity, and the forest trees that you had looked up to as very large are suddenly dwarfed. 
The same thrill strikes you when overhead the great wings of the vultures spread out and with mighty strokes carry the huge bird in wide circles up through the sky. And as you look down, the turkey vultures sailing below seem like little more than circling swallows. Um, this is so much like a passage that George Barnston wrote. It's a lot like what Townsend wrote. It's a lot like what Lewis and Clark wrote. This, these birds just capture the poetic side of humans. And that's a good thing. We need that to happen more probably. So I'm gonna leave you with that. And, and I'm I, again, I thank you for inviting me and I'm happy to answer any questions or listening to any comments that you have. Thanks so much. Um, Jack, this is Vicki and what a wonderful story. I feel like I've been in a detective novel, <laughs> tracing down important clues. And uh, I do invite anyone who has comments or questions to go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, ask your questions. Um, Hello? Yes. Hi, my name is Steve Hampton. Hi, um, thank you very much. I, I saw condors in the wild when I was a little kid um, before they were um, taken into captivity. Um, so my, my question is, I noticed um, that that um, the, the earliest uh, uh, European explorers were calling them California vultures or California condors right from the start. Where, where does the name come from? Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, there was a Franciscan uh, monk who was with a Spanish, uh, one of the early Spanish expeditions, and this is told in that Visible Bones piece, and he saw them uh, swirling around, just like Vernon Bailey describes them, uh, and, and being really thrashy and loud and active. Uh, it's, a, it's one of the great, uh, to me, true descriptions of how condors are supposed to behave. And because he saw them in California, then everybody then from that time called them California. And originally, you know, all the, uh, <laughs> some of the birders wanted the Northwest ones to be a different species, but they quickly found out that it was the California condor. And uh, Lewis and Clark call it the, the beautiful buzzard of the Columbia. But it turns out that, the, you know, when they got the skull back, they could see that it was the same species. So it becomes the California vulture. Condors comes much later when they start thinking about the Andean condors. Hi, Jack. Hi. Hi, I'm Steve. I wrote a comment in the chat box. I was taken back by your recovery program slide because the black uh, the black ink sketch was drawn by a friend of mine, John Schmidt. Oh. We were uh, okay. guarding a pair of falcon nest site in the late 70s in Los Padres National Forest, and, and that condor flew by the historic oh, nesting okay. cliffs where our oh, peregrines were nesting. So that, that is a personal memory for me to see that drawing because I who, that who, bird who, flew who, right by us. Who's the person who drew it? That's fantastic. His name is John Schmidt. He's a contributing artist to a recent edition of National Geographic Field Guide to Birds. He's also yeah. a renowned taxidermist. Yeah. He has also prepared condor taxidermy mounts. Okay. I, I heard his when Rob Fawcett was looking for somebody to do the bird for the Douglas exhibit, John Smith was busy. I remember him saying that. He's just too overwhelmed with work and couldn't do it. That is I really appreciate that. Yes. I really appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, again, nice that. Uh, they so this was in the late seventies when you guys saw this bird. In fact, that, that was nineteen seventy eight. Well, and well. Uh, I'm I'm still involved as a volunteer. There's a historic fire lookout near this site, and we restored that lookout where we recruit volunteers and college students to radio track condors. 
and we hope they actually return to these nesting cliffs in the future and reoccupy them. That's perfect. I certainly will tell the, um, you know, if they, if they get them back in the Umpqua, that chain of lookouts is there waiting for them to reuse as well. That makes such good sense. It's funny, but every time I've done this talk, there's somebody who got taken hold of by peregrines in the 70s just before they were, you know, taken out of the wild and they really let them go. They, they just, this, which is also my experience. I just can't, you can't let, let, let something like this or drawing the John Smith go. And that is one of my favorite ones that I've seen of an illustration because of, he puts it at, is this Mount Pinos? <clears throat> Here, Mount Pinos? Uh, well, it would be north of that. This, this okay. particular site. In fact, the background cliffs are not the actual cliffs that we were monitoring. He, he put that in, but um, this location is in the central coast area of California, known as San Luis Obispo County in the back country. Okay. Los Padres okay. National Forest. Okay. Well, I appreciate you. I appreciate you telling us that. Thank you, Steve. Great, thanks. Uh, this is Vicki chiming in, and I just wanted to say I saw a quick message from Elaine, and um, she was having um, internet problems at her house, and she was actually next door for uh, some part of this evening. And whatever the difficulties uh, she's experiencing, she is still experiencing, so she's not able to. Um, take the screen back. So, uh, but that doesn't mean we need not to ask the questions or offer comments. And I certainly hope um, others in the audience will continue to do so. Yeah, somebody actually had a question after Steve. So somebody was trying to say something. Uh, yes, uh, Jack, my name is Dave Kraft. I live in Kettle Falls. Okay. And I saw you at the, uh, the Interpretive Center speak one time and I think it was on David Douglas. So I really appreciated that. So the Kettle Falls being like the second largest fishery on the Columbia, any hints of condors in that? Not a one. There's not one record that, uh, you know, that's one of the great mysteries is if there were, if there were part of the world and they were in Eastern Washington, why wouldn't they go to a place like Kettle Falls? I don't, I can't answer that. I don't know, but, and there, uh, the Okanagan, I haven't found any word from uh, the Okanagan Salish people that sounds like it might work for condor except one. And um, I, I'm still investigating that, I guess. I mean, if if in my world, there should be a word for it. They should have, they should have been part of the scene there. They were down at the house, but I don't know. There's I should point out there's really good records for condors that come up the Columbia and sail across the rock and the Blackfeet have a word for them, and they were obviously eating buffalo uh, when there were a lot of buffalo on the prairies. So um, that's, I'm still looking, <laughs> Dave. I would love to find it. None of the early white guys, which, as you know, there aren't that many accounts of the kettles. None of the early white guys see condors there. All right, thank you. Hi, hi it's Richard James in Victoria. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, uh, before the presentation, I had mentioned that I had seen condors at Pinnacles National Park in California. Uh -huh. They asked me if I would elaborate on that. They're certainly very impressive birds. We saw them in 2013. Um, not close up, unfortunately, we only had part of a day there. Uh, but if you're in that area, it's very well worth taking a look at them. And a, a lot of the people that I talk to, that's where that's a very dependable place to go see them because it's kind of contained. Um, you can see them in Big Sur. You can certainly see them in Four Corners and Grand Canyon just by going down there. At Big Sur, the ranger they had to get hire a dedicated ranger to just tell people where the condors were that day because that became the most common question as people drove down the coast and the pinnacles um, works for that really well yeah i have not been there uh, i was there long before they planted them but i haven't been back and that's the place on my list to go for sure mm -hmm. and the the other bird that we found there the first time i'd ever seen it was the acorn woodpecker which is an amazing bird mm -hmm. yeah 
Yeah, it looks just like a condor. It looks like a little condor. Very, very colorful, very vocal, and go around in flocks. <laughs> Do you know of any resources to find what uh, bird species were present in the Northwest in like the mid 19th century? Uh, that's an interesting question. That's a really interesting question. Um, I have all the lists that were made. I mean, there was there was somebody that wintered at Fort Colville where Dave was talking about at Kettle Falls and, and keeps a bird list. Townsend has a good bird list. Um, if you look at the that visible bones book has a bibliography in the back that has most of the lists in it, I believe. And um, yeah, I think that'd be a place to start. Brian Sharp's paper uh, on condors that you can get online, you can download it from online. That has, I'm not sure that has all the lists, but it's a start. Thank you. I, you're still muted, Vicki. You have muted yourself. There you go. Oh, thank you very much. I'm sorry. Um, we very, very much appreciate your sharing this information that you have unearthed <laughs> from talking to so many people and research, doing such fine research. Um, I'm going to check out Visible Bones now, <laughs> see, see what else is in there. And I, um, again, thank you for sharing uh, this wonderful presentation. And hope that um, everyone in the audience will join us next month when we will also be looking at birds that are even much farther back in, in time and um, look forward to, um, to seeing you next month. Thank you very much, Jack. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Vicki. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Good night. Good night.